this is me in our first meeting, Kevin O'Brien, Flannery O'Connor Online Book Club. I have some trepidation about discussing A Good Man is Hard to Find. It's not an easy story to read or to talk about. It's probably Flannery's most famous. It's the first one published in her first collection of short stories. And here behind me, we have a uh, cemetery that I came upon while hiking in the woods. I thought it was an appropriate background to discuss this story. Flannery herself helps us. What on earth is this story about? How on earth can this story be about the Christian faith? It is so shocking and disturbing. But let's take a look at it. And let's take a look, first of all, at some of the things that Flannery herself says about this story. She says a lot in her letters. Let's begin at the bottom of the page with this one. She talks about someone, well, there were a couple of young teachers there, and one of them, an earnest type, started asking the questions. Miss O'Connor, he said, why was the misfit's hat black? I said, most countrymen in Georgia wore black hats. He looked pretty disappointed. Then he said, Miss O'Connor, the misfit represents Christ, does he not? He does not, I said. He looked crushed. Well, Miss O'Connor, he said, what is the significance of the misfit's hat? I said it was to cover his head. And after that, he left me alone. Anyway, that's what's happening to the teaching of literature. So we're not going to worry about insignificant details that probably don't really contribute to the meaning of the story. But let's look at this, because this really is the center of the story. Then we're going to look at the story itself here at the bottom. Hayes knows what the choice is, and the misfit knows what the choice is. Either throw everything, throw away everything, and follow him, capital H, or enjoy yourself by doing some meanness to somebody. And in the end, there's no real pleasure in life, not even in meanness. That's pretty much the meaning of the story. She says, and let's go back here so we can see the whole sentence at the very bottom. More than in the devil, I am interested in the indications of grace. She means as a writer in her stories. The moment when you know that grace has been offered and accepted, such as the moment when the grandmother realizes the misfit is one of her own children. These moments are prepared for, by me anyway, by the intensity of the evil circumstances. And then she talks about some of her other stories. Um, here we go again. There is a moment of grace in most of the stories, or a moment where it is offered and is usually rejected, like when the grandmother recognizes the misfit as one of her own children and reaches out to touch him. It's the moment of grace, for her anyway, a silly old woman, but it leads him to shoot her. This moment of grace excites the devil to frenzy. Okay. Here we go. The misfit is touched by the grace that comes through the old lady when she recognizes him as her child, as she has been touched by the grace that comes through him and his particular suffering. His shooting her is a recoil, a horror at her humanness. But after he has done it and cleaned his glasses, the grace has worked in him, and he pronounces his judgment. She would have been a good woman if he had been there every moment of her life. True enough. In the Protestant view, I think grace and nature don't have much to do with each other. The old lady, because of her hypocrisy and humanness and banality, couldn't be a medium for grace in the Protestant view. In the sense that I see things the other way, I'm a Catholic writer. Wow. There's a lot there. In a sense, this story is about a family that's like the Simpsons. Think about it. It's almost the same kind of, um, 
a, a mixture and a dynamic. You've got the father, Bailey, Bailey boy, as his mother calls him after he's been killed. You have the father who's ineffectual, like a Homer Simpson. He can't really get anything done. He gives in when the kids and the grandmother deliberately target him in the car and nag him without any, without mercy, without any let up, he finally agrees to do what he doesn't really want to do. He does what he does, what eventually gets them all killed. He makes the detour, the detour to find this house, this more or less imaginary house that the grandmother has remembered. And then when they're in that horrible situation where the misfit and his henchmen are upon them with their guns, he stands crouched as a runner, ready to run, ready to do something. He's the father of the family. He's the only male adult, but he can't do anything. Could he have done anything? That's another question. He certainly is a Homer Simpson. He's kind of an emasculated and ineffectual father figure. You've got the mother who's got these two little rabbit ears of this thing that she's tied around her head with the baby, kind of Marge and Maggie. And then you've kind of got Bart and Lisa, these two brats that are traveling with the family. The grandmother seems to be really the most um, focused character, the most certainly the most intense and deliberate character throughout the entire tale. We see by the end of this story, when they meet the misfit and his henchmen, a raw and disturbing evil. And this horrific tale of this whole scale slaughter by these criminals of this family is an evil that is difficult to forget once you read it. But I would say that there's another softer version of evil that's going on in the first half of the story. And that is the way this family treats one another. There's manipulation, there's the spoiled kids. When they're at the diner, the little girl, you know, the, the, the cook, the woman, the wife says, I wish, I, I wish you was my little girl. I wouldn't be your little girl for a million dollars. I wouldn't live in a dump like this. These are, these are really horrific, dysfunctional people. But there's something there. And the thing that's there is not only are they a family and we root for their survival, but there is something even in the grandmother, even in the fact that she's trying to manipulate the situation. And she's very much like a lot of grandmas you might know. Uh, by the time they get in their horrific position, what is exposed is both the, the fact that this dysfunctional family is then at their wit's end and the kind of soft evil that's been going on in this family meets a greater version of itself because the misfit is a nihilist pushed to an extreme. If we are all sinners and we are all misfits in a sense, he is as far as you can go with that picture. He's almost the character in Dostoevsky's, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment who gives himself over to a life of meanness just for the sake of being mean. But perhaps as in Crime and Punishment, he himself learns a kind of lesson at the end. Let's look at the story bit by bit and see if we can figure out a little more what's really going on. First of all, you have these little things that Flannery does that I think are wonderful. In the midst of these stories, it is often difficult to appreciate the humor. Bailey didn't look up from his reading. So she wheeled around and then faced the children's mother, a young woman in slacks whose face was as broad and innocent as a cabbage. What a wonderful expression of the mother in this story, because that's her character as much as how she looks. Her face as broad and innocent as a cabbage. Well, they end up going on their little trip. And the mother talks about where she grew up, Tennessee. 
Let's go through Georgia fast so we don't have to look at it much, John Wesley said. John Wesley, named after the founder of the Methodist Church. If I were a little boy, said the grandmother, I wouldn't talk about my native state that way. Tennessee has the mountains and Georgia has the hills. Tennessee is just a hillbilly dumping ground, John Wesley said, and Georgia's a lousy state too. You said it, June Starr said. In my time, said the grandmother, folding her thin veined fingers, children were more respectable of their native states and their parents and everything else. People did right then. Oh, look at that cute little pickaninny, she said, pointing to a Negro child standing at the door of a of a shack. So you have these horrible little children who don't respect, they don't respect anything. And the grandma carries this image of her home state, her home region, East Tennessee, where she remembers this mysterious plantation house that she recalls from her youth, but recalls imperfectly. And yet even though the grandmother is trying to instill some sort of sensibility and morality into the family, immediately she talks in racist ways about the little black child they see at the side of the road. I'm old enough to remember when old ladies would use the phrase pick and any to refer to, as Flannery would say, Negro children. So she's giving us a real taste of how people in the South behave. He didn't have any britches on, June Starr said, a poor little boy that they pass and that the grandmother just makes fun of in a way. They end up going to this place where they eat and uh, uh, Red Sammy's and we meet Red Sammy and we meet his wife and Red Sammy talks about, two fellers come in here last week, Red Sammy said, driving a Chrysler. It was an old beat up car, but it was a good one and these boys looked all right to me. Said they worked at the mill, you know. I let them fellers charge the gas they bought. Now why'd I do that? Now here we start hearing what a lot of old people do. Those of you who are students of mine in this book club will know that this is how old people talk. They talk about the old days. They talk about how things are worse now than they've ever been. They talk about their perfect but difficult childhood and how they had to walk miles and miles to get to school. And they romanticize uh, the past. So he's wondering, why did he let these boys charge their gas and not pay for it up front? Because apparently he thinks that he's been, he's been stiffed. These boys are never gonna come back and actually give him money for the gas they bought. Now, why did I do that? He says, because you're a good man the grandmother said at once. Yes, am I suppose so, Red Sam said, as if he were stuck, struck with this answer. Now, this story is called A Good Man is Hard to Find. Sometimes I'm gonna share a screen and sometimes I'm not. You're a good man, the grandmother says to Red Sammy. And that strikes him. This is sort of just a kind of a conventional conversation, as I say, that old people would have. Well, why'd I let these boys take advantage of me? Well, because you're a good man. Well, she doesn't really know him, whether or not he's a good man. But when she says that to him, it strikes him and he thinks about it. Yes, I'm, I suppose I am. Later, when they meet the misfit, she keeps telling him that he's a good man. A good man is hard to find. I think it's Red Sammy who says that at about this moment in the story. Now, the grandmother, when they meet the misfit, is trying to save her life. So she's, in a sense, flattering him. But we see here at the midway point of the story that the grandmother has a kind of insight. And when she says this to Red Sammy, he reflects upon it. Well, maybe I am. Well. Maybe in a sense the misfit is, even though he's a, an escaped convict and a murderer. Is the misfit more than we think he is? Well, eventually in the story, the grandmother and the children nag Homer Simpson, the father, to turn off the road 
and to get into this horrible adventure that leads to the deaths of all of them. Grandmother remembers a house that she thinks is in Georgia. And when they turn down that road and they get lost, she eventually has this horrible recognition that the house was in Tennessee. It's almost, it's almost the beyond. It's almost the golden age. It's almost a memory of Eden itself. She's thinking back to a perfect time, a time when you didn't have to leave your screen door latched, as Red Sammy says. This imaginary time before, when you could find good men, when they weren't so hard to find. This thing that our hearts yearn for, because we're all misfits. As G.K. Chesterton says, we are homesick in our homes and homeless under the sun, and they lay in their heads in a foreign land whenever the day is done. Talking about mankind, homeless in their homes and homesick under the sun. One of the indications that our faith is real is that we're not content here in the cave. We want to escape the cave and the shadows on the wall. We want to see the full three-dimensional realities that these shadows that we see on the wall of the cave that we're imprisoned in represent. We have a yearning of something beyond. Even this grandmother, miserable though she is as a human being throughout much of the story, has that. It's that very yearning that gets the family to make the tragic mistake that they make in turning down this road and eventually getting caught by the misfit. Let's look a little bit at the dialogue that happens between the misfit and the grandmother. If you look on Google, one of the things that people do, apparently this story is assigned in, I would imagine, college courses most of the time. And the question is, what does this talk about Jesus mean at the end of the story? As if that isn't the central point of everything that happens in the story. Well, I didn't read what some of the answers are on the internet, but this isn't just an exercise in studying literature. This whole book club is supposed to be a way of, of us learning how to be more real about our faith, if we have faith. Some of you perhaps don't. Well, I used to be an atheist, and I do, or at least I try to. I try to be true to whatever faith I have. We had an accident, and they're at the mercy. They're at the mercy under this cloudless sky where they can't quite see the sun, but the sky is cloudless. They're almost, they're almost at the edge of human existence. They are almost in a transcendent realm. That's why the sky is cloudless, but they can't see the sun. They're in, they're, they're in a, a moment of transfiguration almost. They're, they're at the mountaintop, almost literally, and they're seeing in their horror a more pure vision of the reality of existence. Now, We learn about the misfit that he's got a kind of a vulnerability in some of the ways he's described. At one point, the grandma looks down on him and sees his black hat and sees his shoulder blades because he's not wearing a shirt. He's embarrassed not to be wearing a shirt. He's not embarrassed to kill the family, but there is a vulnerability about him. She says, I know you're a good man, she said desperately, because all of their lives are at stake. You're not a bit common. No, I ain't a good man, the misfit said after a second, as if he had considered her statement carefully. But I ain't the worst in the world, neither. My daddy said I was a different breed of dog from my brothers and sisters. You know, daddy said, it's some that can live their whole life without asking about it and it's others has to know why it is. And this boy is one of the ladders. What's he talking about? It's some that can live their whole life without asking what it is. What what is? 
life. It's some that can live their whole lives without asking what it is, it being life or it being anything. But there's some that can't. They have to know, and this boy is one of the latter. The misfit, we are all misfits. Certainly the 12 apostles were misfits. There's no doubt about that. Losers and misfits. Jesus' most intimate disciples, he calls the misfits to follow him. The misfit wants to know more. The misfit is not happy being evil in a common way, that this dysfunctional family is evil. He's pushed it to beyond that. He's also arrested and convicted of something he doesn't even remember. He doesn't even know if the punishment fits the crime. My friends, this is us. We are broken. Whether you believe in the doctrine of original sin, which is the only explanation for it, or you just look about you and see that we are broken, misfit, misshapen individuals who have a yearning for perfection and completion, but who can never get there. And who somehow are bearing the burden of a kind of guilt and suffering that we don't fully understand. This tells us what that burden of suffering is and how it is fixed. But the misfit doesn't get that, even though at one point he was a preacher, he's been a little bit of everything. He's kind of every man. He's had every job there can be. He's seen everything there is. He's even seen a woman flogged. He is the misshapen every man. When Pilate, when Pontius Pilate brings Christ out after he's been whipped and scourged and his flesh has been torn, he brings him out on the balcony and he shows them to the crowds who are screaming for his crucifixion. And he says, behold the man. Eke homo, behold the man. And there stands our Lord and Savior, bloodied and brutalized, torn to pieces. Behold the man. That is suffering humanity. It's not just Jesus having been tortured. It's behold mankind suffering and brutalized in a way that seems absurd. What possible point is there? for this innocent man, Jesus Christ, to be treated with contempt and to be tortured the way he was tortured and to be exposed to the crowds and to their ridicule. What could that mean? What does it mean for the misfit? He doesn't know, but he finally pushes it to a point where, as Flannery says in her letters, we all know, or at least we get the point of this story. The family is taken away. The family is slaughtered. And by the end of the tale, the grandmother, who is herself at this transcendent moment where she sees beyond everyday reality, she keeps pleading for herself and for him. She's saying, Jesus, Jesus, but it sounds as if she's cursing because it's so unusual for us to hear people calling on the name of our Lord from this moment of complete desperation. Normally when we hear people say the name, they're saying it as a curse word. Jesus, Jesus, meaning Jesus will help you. But the way she was saying it, it sounded as if she might be cursing. I'm reading here, we're at the first complete paragraph. Yes, am the misfit said as if he agreed. Jesus thrown everything off balance. It was the same case with him as with me, except he didn't commit any crime. And they could prove I had committed one because they had the papers on me. Jesus throwed everything off balance. She knows that her son has been killed. She knows the whole family is being slaughtered in these woods, these mysterious woods. Bailey boy, Bailey boy, as if her heart would break. Jesus was the only one that ever raised the dead, the misfit, misfit continued. Her family is all dead now, the grandmother's family, and she's about to die. So the conversation turns toward death, quite naturally. 
Jesus was the only one that ever raised the dead, the misfit continued, and he shouldn't have done it. He thrown everything off balance. If he did what he said, then it's nothing for you to do but throw away everything and follow him. And if he didn't, then it's nothing for you to do but enjoy the few minutes you got left the best way you can by killing somebody or burning down his house or doing some other meanness to him. No pleasure but meanness. Well, there's his philosophy. Now, my friends, that's true. This horrific man is speaking the truth. If there is no meaning to existence, including to death, including to life, which is ended by death for all of us, if there's no meaning beyond death, and there couldn't be if Jesus didn't raise the dead and if that whole story is a lie. If that's the case, there's nothing for it but to burn down somebody's house or shoot a bunch of people just for the joy of shooting them or to do what the main character in Crime and Punishment does, to get your jollies by being mean. Either we assert the meaning in life or we discover it. Well, if we assert the meaning in life subjectively, which is what most people believe, we can assert whatever meaning we choose because there is no meaning. And what we assert can't really be called meaning. It's just our, our own will. Well, you might will to be a, a good person. I might will to be a real SOB. There's no difference. Because if there's no actual meaning, whatever we assert, we assert. And if you want to be mean, burn down somebody's house. I mean, after all, there's no pleasure in anything but meanness, or the dead has, have been raised. And suffering is placed in context. And guilt and sin have a solution. If that's true, if this is true, and you give up everything and follow it, you follow him. And those of us who are Christian and who don't follow him perfectly, which is all of us really, we should be ashamed because if this is true, this villain, the misfit knows enough to say, the thing to do is give up everything and follow him. But if it's a lie, do whatever the hell you want because it doesn't matter. That's the point Flannery is making in this, the most famous of her stories, and the first one. And the grandmother at the brink of death, under this purely shining sky where you can't even see the sun, the grandmother looks down at him, wearing eventually her own murdered son's stupid shirt with the parrots on it. And she sees the misfit in her son's shirt and she recognizes that he is a lost soul. It's almost a Marian moment where she knows that he is her boy, like Bailey boy. He is like all of us, lost and desperate, like all of your neighbors who need your witness as Christians and you probably don't have the courage to give them good witness because you can't remember what the misfit does, which is we live every day on this edge that only these stories bring out to us because she puts her characters in this incredibly intense situation in each of her stories where the real reality of the transcendent breaks through because of the stress they're under. Forgetting that, we can't reach out to our sons and daughters and brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers around us and help them get through this mess. But she sees the truth and she knows he's her boy. And we'll look at that. We're almost done with this story. 
Why, you're one of my babies. You're one of my own children. She reached out and touched him on the shoulder. By the way, there are many moments in this story when she recognizes him. When she sees him at first, she knows that she's seen him, and in a way she feels as if she's known him her entire life. That's not just because she's seen his picture in the newspaper as a, as a wanted criminal. Later, she recognizes him as the misfit, and she says something, and her son, Bailey Boy, swears and curses at her because in saying this, she gets them all killed. But that first recognition is a hint that she knows him at a deeper level, and this is where it comes out. You're one of my own children. And he is, not biologically. He's wearing the shirt of Bailey Boy. But she loves her children and her grandchildren, spoiled and miserable and messed up as they are. She reached out and touched him on the shoulder, the moment of grace, like a pin popping the balloon. The misfit sprang back as if a snake had bitten him and shot her three times through the chest. Then he put his, put his gun down on the ground and took off his glasses and began to clean them. Without his glasses, the misfit's eyes were red-rimmed and pale and defenseless looking. He is not a monster. He is one of her children. Take her off and throw her where you've thrown the others, he said, picking up the cat that was rubbing itself against his leg. Wow, what an image that is. She was a talker, wasn't she? Bobby Lee said, sliding down the ditch with a yodel. She would have been a good woman, the misfit said, if it had been somebody there to shoot her every minute of her life. True. <laughs> That's why Flannery in all of her stories brings us these characters to a point where somebody's trying to shoot them. And if we could live at that intensity every moment of our lives, we would all be good women and good men. A good woman is hard to find as much as a good man is hard to find. But these moments make us realize how we can be good. Some fun, Bobby Lee said, meaning this slaughter that they've just engaged in. But the misfit isn't in the mood because he has seen through the transcendent as well. He himself has seen to a deeper reality along with the grandmother. Shut up, Bobby Lee, the misfit said. It's no real pleasure in life. Meaning there is no real pleasure in life. He wants to give himself over to the only pleasure he thinks there is, being mean. Some of us don't get much joy in that. Some of us would rather give ourselves over to hedonism in various ways. Money, power, eating, sex, all that stuff. But ultimately, when we're satiated or when the horror strikes us of what we're doing, we say, shut up, Bobby Lee. We say, as the misfit does, it's no real pleasure in life. That's also the lesson in crime and punishment. Well, that's the story. Now, I don't know if I did it justice, but at least I tried to bring some of my love for Flannery and for the story and for my faith into what I'm talking about. Here's what you do. You can comment about it in the comment section. Go back and forth. Be decent to one another. Let's not have internet comments on this site the way internet, internet comments are on many sites. You know what, I'm, what I mean. Let's try to keep this civilized and fun. You can disagree with me. Please do. Let's see if we can get a discussion going. Eventually, we will meet live. We will have live video meetings and do that kind of stuff, but we'll probably only do that a few times a year. I'm going to put up another video later on that Father Barron made about Bishop Barron, that is, about Flannery O'Connor. And uh, I might say something about her letters and about a wonderful article about her that Rob Dreher linked to in his uh, uh, American conservative site. But this is who we're dealing with. And these are how these stories work. These are amazing tales written by an amazing woman. I think I'll do another video today, as I said, about some of her letters and about this article about her that was written by an archbishop, of all things. 
And hopefully that will help you recognize that she's not just writing these stories to shock us or to entertain us. She's doing something much more important and artistic. Okay, kids, that's it. See you next time.